We're learning, we're learning every single day. Uh, we're learning. <laughs> How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, so we are set. We are good to go now. Excellent. Same here. All right. Um, so the first question I'm going to ask. ask resulted in you building such an impressive institution. Okay. Um, sorry, you broke up quite badly, so I didn't get the question. I just said the last part. I said something. All right. What are some of the little and big steps you took, ah. uh, the consistent habits that resulted in you building an imp such an impressive institution? Interesting. Okay, I think I think the first principle is a principle that we all know, which is basically to start small but dream big. Okay, so uh, take the steps of always having a larger vision uh, than you have, knowing that you can achieve whatsoever you can see in your mind's eye. But at the same time, follow the principles of starting step by step. If you start too big, you have a problem. I can hear you. Yeah. So I said, start small, dream big. Okay. Very important. All right. All right. Um, so someone says, for people who want to scale their businesses, uh, what are the three most important things they should focus on this season? Well, this season is ex extremely interesting. Okay, because the first aspect of it is that many, business, many businesses are going to have to change. So the first thing you want to look for is resilience. Which businesses were resilient through this uh, uh, crisis? So you want to find resilience. So if you are going to scale, scale with resilience. That's the first aspect of it. Second, there are new needs that are going to come up. Many things, many things are going to open up. Many opportunities will open up based on the needs that will come. Now, you want to scale according to need, not scale just for the skill, uh, scaling sake. So the second thing is to ensure that there is a need that you are meeting. That's the next thing. Now, the third aspect of it is that you must be able to fill the gap yourself. So do you have the knowledge gap? That, do you have the knowledge skills for the gap that you are looking to fill? Very important. Hmm. All right. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this from me. Um, you studied architecture. You started out this way. Um, I, I mean, for a young person listening to, uh, here who, is, who wants to come up in life, um, how did you end up in the oil industry? <laughs> you know, it's an interesting, <laughs> very interesting question. Um, because, you know, architecture in itself, uh, first and foremost, was for me a life changer. It was something that I got into, and the entire discipline of learning architecture for me was beautiful. It taught you how to present. It taught you how to be bold in front of people because you're always standing and you're talking to a crowd. You're always presenting something, so that taught me. It taught me how to work on projects. So big and things like that for me became a natural because you were always working towards a deadline. It taught you that you needed to be able to scale yourself and uh, make sure that you knew exactly what you were doing so that you can meet a particular deadline. And the work was plenty. For those of us that went to Unilag, would remember at that time that architecture in itself was called architecture because many people just could not meet the deadlines uh, like that. So architecture for me formed the basis. Now the architect is taught that he's a leader of teams, which means that wherever you come out, you can lead teams. So moving from architecture and being somebody who is always adventurous, I found myself in Brazil working as an architect. And then I come back to Nigeria at the time because my father was running for politics, uh, running for president back in the day. Come back to Nigeria and all of a sudden I get an uh, a request to start a job in an engineering company. 
Now, for me, this was something that was totally out. But I was young and adventurous. So I go into an engineering company, which was somewhat linked to architecture. And I discover that all of those things that we were taught in school, leader of the team, presentation, relationships, business management, and all, came fully into play. And so I found out at that point that business development was something that came almost naturally to me. Um, oil and gas suddenly happened because June 12th happened. Nigeria went in a crisis like now, the same kind of crisis we were in. People were out in the streets. Now we are locked in. In those days, we were out there. Everybody was out in the street. Nigeria was, nobody knew what was going to happen. The company that I was working in gets up and leaves Nigeria. They liquidate the company. One minute I had a job, the next minute I'm in no job at all. And at that point, adversity, adversity, and a crisis caused to go and launch what is called Sahara today. And that's how we entered into oil and gas. All right. Um, let me ask you another question before I get into it. Let me just ask you. You succeeded, you made money early. All right. Um, not many people who are exposed to that level of wealth at an early age will be as stable as you are today. So what are the factors that helped in guiding you in managing success uh, and keeping your head on, on, on uh, properly balanced? Well, I, I would say, uh, first and foremost, um, it was, first, not being alone, okay? Uh, we started off a company where there were three of us. And very, very early, we came to an agreement that you had to have a unanimous decision. In other words, if one person dissented in any idea that we were going to have, then it wasn't going to go forward. And so you knew that you needed to convince all of us about anything that you wanted to do, which meant that the ability to just carry yourself and start running anyhow was limited. You now needed to think very, very hard about what you wanted to do. That was number one. Number two, when it came to money as well, very early, very, very early at the very start, we came to an agreement that we were not going to earn an income at the beginning of the business, but that everything was going back into the business. The business was first. We made sure that every single income that we had went back into the business for the first three years. Now, for anyone who goes to any business school, at this point, we are not, we are not doing business school analysis. We we're just working on the gut feeling that said that if you have something, uh, you needed to make sure that you nurtured it. Now, remember, I said I was coming from a place where I had just lost a job. <clears throat> so at this point, there was no going back. This, for me, was the only way out. So there was no going back. I could not afford at that point to fail, which meant that this became life and death for us. So the first three years of any young business, right, is critical. The first year, most businesses will fail. By the third year, any business that has not structured properly by the third year is going to be in trouble. So those first three years for us was about making sure that all the money we made went back into the business. And that's what was financial discipline. So remember the first one was partnership. We had to convince everybody that any idea we were taking forward worked for all of us. The second one was financial prudence. We had to make sure that all the money we had went back into the business. And then the third aspect of it was that each party, each party was equal in the shareholding of the, of the company. So it meant that everybody puts in the same amount of work. Once you knew that I was an equal partner across, I wouldn't sit down and say, let this person work and I would not work. And those three at the beginning of any young business was critical. And I think it's paid off a lot for us. All right. Then I, I want to switch a bit to politics. Uh, recently, we saw you um, switch, all right, and enter into the political scene. Um, we even saw a video of you campaigning, gunshots being fired. You know, <laughs> what, I mean, I mean, the question the person will ask is, this is a man who has a family, who has a wife, who has children, who is successful in business, what motivated you to put yourself into that position, you know, very risky uh, environment to be in? You know, um, and, and this is a question that a lot of people ask. 
Because what their thinking is basically is, look, you're very successful. You have a business that is multinational. You've done well as far as you can go anywhere in the world. Uh, you are recognized as one of the top business uh, players on the continent. You are in the UN, you are the World Economic Forum. You know, there are so many things that would be said. Uh, and all of that is well and good. No problem there. But Pastor Pojun, I said something, right? I left Brazil and I came back to Nigeria. I came back to Nigeria for one reason at the time, which was that my father was running for politics. I was 24, 25 thereabouts. I had a zeal, you know, back then, as a young Nigerian at that age, why I left and came back was because I believed 100% that we had a great country. We needed, you know, there was so much patriotic favor. Then a lot happened. We were in school together. We know that era. Now, when that thing happened, the military took over. They locked every politician in jail. People went into exile. Everything went. We all made a decision, which for me, it's a decision that we look back and I say that the generation today who were our ages then should not make that same mistake. All of mm. us made a decision. And that decision was, we just said, to hell with politics. Let us leave this politics that you cannot, you don't know. Today you say you are doing this, they are changing it. And let us go where we can hold our destiny in our hands. Now, most young people are saying exactly the same thing. Now, a lot of us went, uh, our colleagues went abroad, some went to America, some went to London, people went to do IT at the time. If you remember, IT was the hot thing and everybody left all their businesses to do IT abroad. Those of us that stayed back in Nigeria decided to just focus on business. So some went into banking, some went into insurance, they bought banks and all of that. And have we done well? We've all done extremely well. No problem. But guess what? In the 30 years that we stayed away from politics, there is no political decision that has been made that has not affected our businesses badly. There is no decision that has been made in Nigerian politics that has not affected our children, our schools, our lives, our income. Every single thing that they make affects us. Then we find out that we have to go cap in hand as well to go and beg people also that the ideas that we have to promote Nigeria right, is worthwhile. And they shoot it down all the time. So when you began to think about these things, you said, how much longer are you going to leave it and just stay outside? And I made a decision that I'm not going to allow our children to go through the same circle. If what it takes is for one of us to get up and go in there and make a way for the children who are 20, 21, 22 to 30 today, for them to be the ones to be in power in 10, 15, 20 years, then let us do it. They don't need to make the same mistakes. And that's why I went there. That's why the gunshots make sense. And that's <laughs> All right. Uh, somebody asks and says that you recently posted online that you attended a governance program at the Oxford University. Aside from those political actors, especially the military, who in times past attended NIPSS crew, uh, it is not often to hear of the education of politicians. What difference can formal education in that sense make to our politics as a country? And if it is material, how should we formalize and embed this into, well, education system? But how does, well, I mean, in that exposure, what, what did it do to you? in terms of okay. importance so, so the first, of getting... yeah, Excellent question, and thank you to, to whoever asked that question. Really excellent. Now, in getting into politics, one of the things that I saw while I was there and all of that is that nobody really cares or has asked about how did we even get here? Everybody kind of has some idea. They can give you some theories and all of that. But there's nothing new under the sun. And historically, if you go back and you look at all the steps, we did not arrive where we are by mistake. There were decisions that were made along the way that took us either off course. There were decisions that were made along the way that did not, that we made mistakes which we ought to have corrected. All of these things are documented. But when you look for the documentation here, it is near impossible to find it. Now, I got an opportunity 
to go to Oxford, right? And Oxford University has some of the, it has one of the widest libraries of books that you can find in the United Kingdom. And guess what? The amount of research they've done on Nigeria is frightening. The amount of research on Nigerian history what the amount of research they've done on nigeria is frightening the amount of research on nigerian history on nigerian politics on the journeys that we have made the mistakes all right um then the next one is like it, and um, it says, um, it's often said that successful entrepreneurs must be willing to make the sacrifice to enter into politics in order to see any real change in our society and politics. In that sense, um, the person says you're a real model. But what gives you the confidence that you will be able to make any change? at all, given how this person says dark the entire political space is for people uh, that are outsiders to that system. Okay. So the first aspect of it, the first, is that there's nowhere that I have ever seen change happen, right? That one person did not get up and make a decision that they were going to do something about it. Now, there's an old saying that it's better, better, to do something than do nothing at all. So for me, the first aspect is that rather than sit down and complain, fold your hands and say that no change can be made, nothing can be done and all of that, get up and do something about it. So the first aspect is that even if we're going to hope for change, you cannot achieve it unless you take the step. So the first aspect is we've taken the step. Now, once we've taken the step, then you know what forces you are facing. You know what you need to do. You know what you need to change. And guess what? It is not as difficult as people think. It's not as difficult to make those changes. Why? Why is that? The mere fact is that most people that you speak to who are on the, online today listening to you and I, those who love Nigeria for whatever reason and another, all they need is the belief that there is somebody who can carry their voice and go and make a difference in there. And they are ready to give that person the support that they need. But they need someone to get up and do something about it. And so for me, the first step is to take that step. I've taken the step. The next thing is to begin to show people that this is the goal. This is where we need to go. This is where you are. But for you to get here, you need to move steps in this direction. And so we are there to show them the direction. And guess what, uh, Pastor Bodrio? It is very possible. That much I can assure you it's possible. Some would say, right, that how do you know it's possible? And I said the first thing that you can be sure of first uh, is that everybody will die one day. So even those who are holding on to power and all, guess what? They are too old. They will die. When they die, who will take over? Are you ready? My Nigerian friends, the young ones, are you ready to get up and fill that vacuum? Or would you just fold your hands until somebody else takes that vacuum? We won't allow that. You have to get up. You really need to get involved. All right. So somebody asks, have you considered collaborating with others to form a new political party? That Do you believe in that? Or, or you can work within the old structures? <laughs> 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 you know, for a long time, uh, for a long time, the argument had always been that the two political parties that you have, right, are one and the same. There's nothing good about them. You need to change the entire structure, bring brand new parties to come in and uh, obtain the apple cart and all of those things. Those are very idealistic positions to take. 
it is good, it's a good to think, it's a good to dream, right? But the reality of it is that unless you go in to the parties that exist and work very hard to ensure that you are part of the decision makers in that party, then they hold too much of the structure to keep you out. So make sure you get in. Nothing stops you from getting in. If you have the zeal, if you have the intelligence, if you have the desire, and you have the patience and, and long-suffering to get there, you will get there. So for me, the parties are there. The structure is already there. They are human beings. My father used to say something to me. He used to say this. Now, when we were in school, secondary school, we used to play anyhow. They used to kid us. We were all over the place anyhow. And we'll come with results that are in the middle of the class and all of that. And me, we had some very bright students who'd be coming first, second, third. You know, people like you, they used to like you. Me, they used to kid me. So they used to come up with the first, second, third, all the time. But my father used to say something which talked with me later. He said, the person who is coming first, does he have two brains? Does he have four eyes, four ears, two mouths? No. Everything about that person, you have exactly the same. It is a decision that you have to make. So for those who are in political party today, those who are ruling, those who are running, those who are holding the keys uh, to the nation, guess what? They have one brain, two eyes, two ears, one nose and one mouth. There is nothing different between you and them. The only thing that I have seen, and believe me, the only thing that I have seen that is different is that they have an audacity that you don't. And the audacity tells them that just try it just go for it don't care just go for it and they take that audacity they go for it you will be sitting down analyzing that no 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 it can't happen it can't no they go for it and they get it so what we are looking for are sharp bright courageous nigerian with patriotism who have audacity and courage if i can assure you if you find them if they have the audacity and the courage nothing will stop them. That much, I assure you, nothing will stop them. Okay, the, the person further asks, let me just, just for clarity um, in this, because this is what uh, the challenge of um, um, middle class people are. Ah, it says, a party is a platform and we understand that true platforms achieve network effects. Right? right. More members they have, more numbers they attract and are therefore very difficult to upstage. But given the sheer number of successful people with reform agenda who try to enter into politics and often don't get a fair chance at winning a ticket through a credible process, as he's talking about primaries now, don't you think there is a demand for a credible party that focuses on internal democracy and fairness for all candidates? And would, won't such a party try? So, one, I 100% agree, right? that there is a need and a desperate need for clarity, for righteousness, for correct processes that would allow individuals of merit to come in. 100%. It is very needed, very needed. Now, the issue is that the people who sit down and craft the gates, who open and put the laws that would allow such a party to succeed, are holding the keys to keep such a party out. Who is going to change the key? Who is going to change the rules that would allow such a party to get up and excel? The people are sitting outside the party. You have to go inside and go and change it. You must get into the Senate first, get into wherever it is that you must get to and go and change that lock. So, you know, we want to be practical about it. Every single Nigerian today, especially what you are seeing through this uh, crisis in COVID, will tell you that enough is enough. It is time for change. It is time for right governance. It is time for people who know what they are doing to come into government. No problem. Everybody knows it. The biggest challenge that all of us have is the question that, but how do you get in to change it? That's the biggest problem. How? It is that how question that keeps everybody out of politics. Guess what? Remember I said something, audacity and courage. Take the audacity, take the courage, go inside. Now, when you have the right mass of people inside there, then you can change it. 
then you can open up the whole place for merit. You can do whatever you want on the inside, but we need to get in to change it. One person alone can't do it. There are big forces that you are fighting, but get up and come. If you set up a party, and there are parties have been set up like this, uh, parties have been set up that have followed uh, those uh, principles. And then guess what? You come at election and they just rig you out anyhow. Total rigging, just rig you out. So you continue, <laughs> it's true. You, so you just continue being frustrated on the outside. Meanwhile, you know what you need to do on the inside. Brothers and sisters, please get up. Let us go and make a difference on the inside. You cannot do it from outside. You can't. All right. Um, you, 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 you've answered a lot of this, but if I ask it as a question, it might, you might add more to it. So this person says, what crucial knowledge or skill should one aspiring to political office in Nigeria, what would you advise that person to possess? I mean, you've talked about Dusty. What else will you say? Okay. I'll say first and foremost, you have to understand the system that you are up against. Okay? Don't assume that there is no system. Don't make the assumption that oh, nothing is happening. You are up against some of the most astute individuals in knowing and, um, and using loopholes. They use the loopholes within every electoral post process, and they know it well. Remember that you're dealing with people who have been in this process well over 20 years, 30 years. They have been doing this. They are well-skilled in knowing how to block here, how to open here, how to enter here. So understand that aspect of it. This is not a short term, just get up and go and jump into it and just be happy, go lucky, anyhow kind of person. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Understand that you are dealing with very astute people. An old politician said to me, he said, when I was uh, going in, he said, don't make the mistake of thinking that the, because you are going to meet people whose English is not at your level, whose education is not at your level, who uh, don't seem to have the networks that you have, don't make, ever make the mistake of thinking that they are not smart. That they are very smart in using the current loopholes to make sure that they can frustrate the living daylights out of you. So the first thing that you have to do is just humble yourself and go and learn. So to everybody who is out there who is listening, please go and learn. Go and sit down at a party, local government party uh, seminar, uh, uh, congress, or program, or meeting. Just go and sit at one. What meeting? Just sit at one. And go and begin to learn the rudiments of it. Understand who you are dealing with. It is only when you know what you are up against that you will know how to overcome it, how to correct it. If not, you have a long way to go. <laughs> All right. Um, before we flip it, let me just ask you. Outside the Bible that I know you read, what are three most uh, impactful books you have read? Hmm. Outside, outside the Bible, I like, I like that qualification and all of that. I would say the first for me is Purpose Driven Life. Huh? Okay. Now, that's by Rick Warren, The Purpose Driven Life. And what did that book do for me? It gave me a very clear, clear path to discovering purpose, understanding your purpose, and knowing why you were created and why you exist on earth. So, for me, that clarified things. The second book that I read that totally did it for me was Finishing Strong. Now, Finishing Strong, for me, told me the story, right, of how so many people start well and very few people finish. So, it gave me this understanding that starting is not the key. Any, they can be hailing you, they can be shouting, clapping for you. Ah, you have started well, you are a strong man. And all of that. that does not bother me at all. What is key is how do you finish? 
how do you get to the goal and all of that so finishing strong very very good book that i loved the last book that i read was um outliers now outliers in itself right what outliers did for me i don't know how he did it i don't know how he did the calculation but he kind of made you understand that there are certain people born in certain windows at certain times in certain decades in certain periods right that seem to just be outliers created to make a difference and it suddenly made sense i so happen to be born in that category right of what you call an outlier born within the right age in the right time right date right period right era right country right nation and all of that so it does not matter where i find myself whether in business whether in politics whether in the church wherever whether it's in diplomacy whether it's in philanthropy whatever i would always be a difference always it doesn't matter why because for some reason we have just been created as outliers. Now, is it our choice? Is it something that we deserved? Is it something that we chose? Absolutely not. Somehow, keeping the Bible out of all of this, we just know that God just placed us there at the right place, right time, in the right era to make a difference. And that's why this, this COVID, this crisis for me, just fits bang into that strategy, bang in. It's no, cry, it's, no, it's no mistake. The year that I was born and the age that I am now to also transit into politics at this point in time. In this crisis, I know you will see the difference. Be guaranteed, guaranteed, guaranteed. It's not a mistake. We are outliers by grace. Okay, let, let me, I'll, I'll come back to this COVID, but let me, let me ask, um, I mean, You've been in business, you've done politics. How do you, one of the hallmarks for people that are successful is the ability uh, to come back after an adversity or a setback, a curveball was thrown. Uh, what are the skills you think are required to be able to overcome adversity? You experience a setback, maybe loss of whatever it is, you lost an investment, you lost or whatever it is, uh, to come back after that. What skills do you think a young person <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Lovely question. <laughs> Lovely question. So the first, the first, my brother, the first is to know that in this life, as long as you live, crisis is part of your life. Another one is going to come. It doesn't matter. Another one will come. Will it be bigger? Will it be smaller? We don't know. But what we are sure about is that one is going to be. As we are coming out of this one, just as you are resting, you are breathing, you are ready to start, you are going up, bam, another one will come. So don't have any worries. Now, the first aspect of it is that mentally, you know that this is what life is about, crisis. Then the second thing that you must know is that no matter what happens in a crisis, some people always find a way to come out of it well. Okay, so... Oh, so the question is, what do they do? How is it that they come out of it? The issue is that most people that will come out of a crisis will understand that crisis, crisis means opportunity first. So yes, some are going to be hit hard by it, but many others enter into that crisis, looking at it and saying that uh, huge opportunities are going to come here. It might mean, and then the third thing is that the third thing is that they are not afraid to change their strategy. They are not afraid. Whatever strategy they were doing before, when that crisis comes, they are very quick to change it. They understand that they must adapt in that period to take advantage of that crisis so that they can come out of it well. So for us, for me, for the business that we've done, for life, for politics, for every single thing, I look at every crisis situation that as we see it coming, we're already mentally prepared that a crisis will come. So that's a normal base. Uh, uh, we're already default prepared. Mode. Default mode, normal. Default mode, normal. So you look at it, when the crisis is coming, hit it with opportunities. As the crisis goes down and all of that, you begin to stock up, just stock up, stock up whatever it is, whether it's cash, whether it's people, whether it's resources, just stock up and prepare them for the next crisis. When the next crisis is there, deploy the people again. Let them go out, start looking for opportunities, change strategy, take advantage of it. 
the circle continues. So basically, that it's a mindset thing. If you have the right mindset in going into a crisis, you will come out of that crisis on top. No problem there. All right. Let, let me ask you. I, I mean, in I, I was saying this today to on on an online teaching session I had that I had my a driver of mine who is seven something year old who is not educated who can speak English. But he said that, she just said to me, the exact words that Boris Johnson, that's Prime Minister of Britain, said in his speech to Britain yesterday, and it was basically, we've not, I have never seen anything like this in my lifetime. I mean, he, he basically said exactly the same thing. So th there's something about this COVID-19 that it has leveled. It's it has it. Ha I mean, I mean, everybody is trapped in Nigeria. We've not seen anything like this before. Nobody can fly out. If even the you know, so everybody knows that we have to solve our problem, all right, or else we might have a bigger problem if we don't solve this problem. So I think it gives, and I think you alluded to this in one, when you were talking about our life that it gives us a massive opportunity for change in this country. Massive opportunity. So what, what do you see? I mean, going forward, how do you see? Because we don't want to lose this and then everybody forgets, you know, well, how, how do we capture this thing so we don't lose this? You know, Padrim, I've said, first I've, I've said to my children, uh, my biological children, I've said to those who are spiritual children, and I've said to those who are a mentor, every single one of them, this scale of a crisis is one that if you see again in your lifetime, if you see again in your lifetime, it's just that maybe God is God and just decided that all of us that are saying that it can never happen again, let him just make it happen just to prove that he's God. However, however, the chances that we will see anything like this in our lifetime ever again is slim. I won't say impossible because I'm not God, but it's slim. Now, what that told me, which is what I have said to every single one of them, is that when something so big is happening, when something, a crisis so big is happening, then please be ready, be ready for the big, big things that will come out of it. Hmm. There are new strategies that will come. There are new businesses that will be bettered out of this. There are new problems, new problems that we have not even thought about that is going to come out because of the scale of the problem. And all of these problems are going to require solutions. All, all of them. Now, for the first time, for the first time, there's nobody, in, whether you are British, American, Nigerian, South African and all, who has answers, which means that anybody who can pull an answer out in this time has gone. Anybody. Anybody who can pull an answer to strategies today has gone. Gone far. So this whole period, one of the things that we have been doing, for me and my family, we are just sitting down every day thinking what are the answers? What problems are coming? How do we pull strategies? What are we doing? And here I will go slightly spiritual, right? God who created this, there's no anybody now who says that this is not God is a big fool. I'm sorry, please forgive me. But <laughs> it has no, I'm serious because people are listening, but they may not understand. Just take it literally. It has been proven that there's no man, no man has been able to get up to explain how this entire thing happened, which means that it's a force beyond all of us. So let's agree. So now that you agree that God himself has created something that has shut down the whole world, if God did it, who has the answers? He has the answers. So go and pull the answers from him. So right now, right now for me, the scale of this crisis means that the scale of the solutions is beyond belief. And this has given us in Nigeria, for those who have eyes to see, and a heart to believe, it has put us at ground zero, where we can take off from, where we can take off from. So instead of asking for small, small things, why don't you just sit down for once and just ask them what are the solutions? Because if you get the solution, you are gone. 
Madagascar is already playing with the solution that they have. And I can assure you that solution, if another two months go by and they finally agree in Europe and America and the Western world that all they are stalling is not answering, guess what? They will be forced to come to Madagascar. So Madagascar is already at a level where they can shoot up. Right now, all the pharmaceutical companies are trying to find an answer. Good luck to them. If they find the answer, fine. But imagine if they don't find the answer and they have to go to Madagascar. Imagine what that means to that country. Imagine what it means to the poor farmers in that place. Imagine what it means to the country that is one of the poorest in the world. And God just decides that this is time to change everything. And I'm going to give you a solution that will change your whole country. And then gives them the answer. Imagine if they have the answer for a disease that has affected the whole world. Imagine, just imagine the potential there. One country in Africa has that. Ah, my prayer, my prayer is that they don't find a cure anywhere. And Madagascar is the answer. That's my prayer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for, for, for what, what advice will you give, just generally speaking, um, people that have small businesses that feel that, you know, I mean, I mean, they are, they are struggling right now, you know, they are. with everything. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what kind of advice do you just give them? Okay, so guys, we've really talked about all these big, big things, big projects, big ideas and all of those things, but there's a reality. And that reality is that there are people who live on a day-to-day -day basis. There are people who get up every single day and they need to survive. And they're doing small, small businesses that need to go. Three things I will tell you. The first aspect of it is that there's still going to be a need for business, small, small businesses. It cannot disappear. It can't. So understand that aspect of it and believe it that even in the new world that is coming now, new economy that is coming now, the SMEs, the small businesses and all of that still have a vital role to play. That's number one. But number two, they need to be flexible and they need to be able to pivot. Why? Because new, new ideas are going to come out that and sorry new businesses and solutions are going to be required that are not far from what you are doing already all you need to do is just be ready to pivot into it so open your eyes because the opportunities exist at different levels so already in your area you have opportunity so look for them make sure you look for them then the third aspect of it for a small business is be ready even now even now that things might seem to be hard just be ready to be flexible in your ways it might mean that you might need to uh, downscale a bit it might mean that certain things that you were doing before you might not have to do it might just mean that you need to survive at this point and just keep going if you can do all of those things, please do it. Just remember, the most important thing is that there's still a role. There is still a role for every business in this world that we're about to see emerge. All right, let me ask you. You've been employing people, all right, in the corporate world for, for, for years. So what is the most attractive qualities um, you find in or what what qualities will a staff have that you will take a second look at this person and say, look, um, um, I, I want this person, you know, up within this organization. We need to retain this person. Uh, what what are the qualities that you, you find? In okay, you know it's interesting uh, because I remember I was just going I was going through your chat before I went to your page and I was just going through your page before coming on and I see one of one young person I don't know if he's young or not but one of the people that was following you excused himself and said that he's not going to listen to this chat why because he knew somebody who had come for a Sahara interview and after going through the entire process got to the final round and we asked the person something like who is your father or something and then or who Anyway, we asked one question that had no, no relation to the job that they were doing, and the person did not make it. And so as a result of that, the person said, I'm not listening to him at all, at all, at all. And I understood what he was. And that's why this question is important. You see, when you are looking for the kind of people uh, that we take, remember what I said. You are looking for people who crisis is not a problem for. We put these interviews that we do, 
are people who are ready to be flexible, ready to be persistent, ready to go through all sorts of things. So the interview process in itself is not for the faint-hearted at all, at all, at all. By the time you get to the final stage of that interview, you yourself, and I will say to that person to go back and ask the person who did not make it, whether that person's life is still the same today, even though they didn't make it. You see, by the time they get to the final interview, they look at themselves and they know just in an interview session, an interview process has changed their total perspective about how they see themselves and how they see life. Imagine that process brings you out at the end. You didn't get the job, but anywhere you go after that, you have confidence. I met a young lady once when I went to speak. She came to meet me. She said, first of all, I disliked you for a long time because I went through this process. I said, really, I'm sorry. Then she said, but later on, when she now found out what that process did to her and her confidence and how it took her to accelerate through life, she came back that day she came to meet me to say, I came to thank you. Because had I not gone through that, I would not have discovered myself. Now, why is this important to your question, Poju? We know what we are looking for. We are looking for people, first of all, who have tenacity. We look for people who have audacity. We look for people who we can throw into the deep end immediately from day one. And we know that they will survive. They are not afraid. We look for people who can think on their feet. You know, we gave somebody an, uh, an inter interview process, so just for people who are listening. And one was a test. So you come in, you have your whole suit tie, you have gone to the best university, Cambridge, Oxford, and we're all there, we've done that. And we said to them that part of the interview process is we want you to go and sell on the streets, hawker. So we gave them some goods and we said, go to the streets and go and sell. And let's see whether you can hawk in the streets. And then we put people to watch. So we went to hide and then they came back and brought money that they have sold. Guess what? That shows integrity. So those who did it automatically lost. But some stood there and they did it. Now what did that show? They showed that they are ready. It does not matter who. They are ready to come and sit whether at the bottom or at the top to get the job done. I cannot tell you how many times. Why is this important, uh, my brother? I can't tell you how many times I have had to sit down in this process of my journey to sit with gate men, to go and eat in the houses of drivers and sit down with them, to eat with them, just so that we know what the next process of the guy is going, to, is going to be. We have become friends with secretaries, drivers, clerks, and all of that, because we need to know and make sure that documentation goes through. I have been to villages that I will never have gone in my life, looking for people who are not in top management, just because their mother is going to call them to say that somebody came to see us and came to greet us. Who is this person? They say, ah, he's uh, MD of this. Really? MD, humility that he will come and look for us. Say, ah, he's a friend of us. I'm friends to drivers, to secretaries, to bosses. Now, if you cannot sell on the streets, if you are too proud, you can't go far. That humility cannot take you. will not go far at all. So what do we look for? <laughs> so these are the things that we look for. That is our process. If you can do that, you can go far. So we find young people who are able to do that. And tomorrow, because we know they can do that, they sit down in the morning, right? And they have face-to-face -face discussions with presidents and ministers without us, face-to-face. -face. They can go and sit down and deal with any president, minister, CEO in the morning. In the afternoon, they will go out and they will go and sit in a buka and they will go and hear the stories of what is happening in the grassroots. In the evening, they will go out and dance and go and play with the boys. They'll go and have their parties, go out, whether they're going to a nightclub or they're going to the bar or they're going to sit down. The same person can be in the morning with the president, in the afternoon with the driver, and by the evening, they're with their uh, mates. And you wonder why they're successful. That is what we look for. That is who we employ. We look for the best that we can find. And when we get them, that's why we are still alive 20 something years later. It's those young people that are prepared at our dishes that are doing it.
All right, let me let, let me just ask this question. <laughs> I asked books. What is the most impactful movie you have watched? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I don't know. There's a movie that keeps coming to mind, and I don't know why. Yeah? And it's Catch Me If You Can. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why it's been coming to mind recently. Because everything about that story, ideally, right, should be that you have somebody who is extremely smart and all of that, who is a con man all through. But what it told me is the end of that process, is the end that I like. And what was the end? By the time he was caught and all of that, the authorities sat down and said, this guy, for you, to have been able to outsmart us completely like this. There's something about you that we need. And they brought him in. And they now used him, right, and his skills and his brain and all of that to block all the fraudulent transactions that could ever happen. They turned him and he became an asset. Why is this important? Every time I go out, and I do, you know, I go out to communities, I see a lot of young people and all of that. I see them doing the wrong thing. And what I see in them, I'm always looking at them to say that there must be some potential in these people that all you need to do is capture it and turn it. And if you can turn it, this person moves from becoming a problem to becoming an asset. Can you turn? Can you turn? Can you turn? So that movie always tells me that don't give up on anyone. Don't give up on anyone. If you find somebody who is extremely smart doing the wrong thing, then maybe what you need to do is show him the way so that he can be extremely smart doing the right thing. And if you can do that, excellent. So that's part of the journey. All right. So one more question, and then I'll just ask you something in closing about the nation. Um, somebody says, as a man sitting, is asking you, as a man sitting on many boards and have formed a lot of strategic partnerships, what are the principles or soft skills? And I think you said a lot of them, Sha. Soft skills you have mastered to get you um, such an advantage. I'll just say people, people management, uh, your people skills. Just respect people. Be humble. Uh, fear God. Be humble. But really respect people. When you get into a boardroom, for goodness sake, just know that you are there to stay. You are not there to come and show everybody that you have arrived and everybody should sit down and listen to you. No, just go with humility. Go there and serve your gift. If you can serve your gift and you always have something to offer, then people will be much, more than willing to continue to ask you to come. So just go and save your gift. So for me, relationship and service, that has been key. I must tell you, this is one of the best interviews I've ever done. I must tell you. Huh? It's one of the best I've done. You're, it's, it's, and I'm, I'm going to make sure I publish this and tell people because people need to hear this. But let me close by just asking you this. You believe Nigeria will make it? Yes or no? Hey, are you kidding? <laughs> My brother, look. Yes or no? So the short answer is yes. Huh? The reason why I believe that Nigeria will be the reason why is that, first, I believe that there's a covenant between God and Nigeria, but we've talked without having to make this too religious. So let me tell you why I believe that Nigeria will make it. Oju, there's nowhere I have been in this world, nowhere, nowhere, that I have not been a Nigerian at the top of the game. The day Nigerians decide anywhere that this is what they want to do, they don't fail. They don't fail. The only thing that we have to achieve in this nation is let us here believe, stop looking out. And that's what COVID is good for. It has shown us that yeah. we have to stop looking out. Now, the minute we stop looking out and we look inwards and Nigerians decide that they are going to make sure that this country will work, I can assure you, as God is my witness, I can assure you that no force will stand in the way. No force. No force. Nigerians, when they decide to do something, whether it's right or wrong, if they decide to be bad, they can be very bad. If they decide that they want to be good, they can change the world. And that is my belief. I know that they can. But we have to speak them into believing that they can change it. And all the way through. All right. Thanks a lot. I'm going to invite you back. You, you, you. There's still much more that we're going to. An hour is gone. Um, <laughs> so thank you, but I'm still going to call you back shortly. Eh? I am more huh? than. 
I'm I've than known you for over 30 years. So anytime I, you know, people don't know I've known you since 1984. All right. <laughs> Somebody asked me, the first time I invited you, Penny said, are you sure he's going to come? I said, okay, you don't understand. <laughs> I said, you don't understand. If you understood, you will know you'll come. <laughs> for, your, for your listeners, let them understand one thing. Relationship is why we are where we are. That is why you can call me. And we, you know, we didn't talk again. From the first day, we just, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see this. And you said Tuesday. Yeah. That was it. We didn't need to talk. You knew I would be there on Tuesday. I knew you would be there on Tuesday. We didn't need to, ah, are you sure you're going to come? That is relationship. That is integrity. That is friendship. My brother, God bless you. Love you so much. Thank you so much, you man. The good one. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, our announcer will come up next for this great interview. It's going to be on my page. Tell your friends, all right, young, they should watch this. Very deep, okay? And it covered a lot of things, entrepreneurship, life, success, and also politics, governance. And what he explained is the exact method on how this country can change in a pragmatic way. All right. Thank you very much. I will announce next time we're coming up and who is coming up. God bless you.